is it beneficial to work at the same engineering company for a long time? At the Engineering Management Institute, we help engineers become better managers and leaders. And in today's episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast, we talk with Gil Hansch, CEO at NSA. Gil talks a little bit about his career journey to CEO, but he also talks about the benefits of working for the same firm for a long time, being that he's been with MSA for a very long time. He also talks about his passion for learning and development and why it's so important to growing firms as well as helping professionals to grow. Gil, let's take it away. Thanks, Anthony. So Gil, it's a, it's a real pleasure to have you, someone in a leadership position like you, who's also an engineer and you've gone through many you know, design projects yourself. Uh, you have really wisdom from all the, the different aspects of becoming an engineer. But before we jump into all of that, Gil, just to get started, tell us a little bit about MSA. How big is the firm? What markets do you serve? Sure. Sounds good. Uh, the firm name is MSA Professional Services. We're currently in 17 offices in the upper Midwest states of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois. Currently, our head counts about 380 people. We're a full-service, multidisciplinary firm, and uh, our corporate purpose is that we enable people to positively impact the lives of others, and the way we do that is through the design of infrastructure that delivers clean water, provides for safe roadways, comfortable buildings, and the environmentally responsible return of wastewater to the environment. Our staff consists of engineers, architects, planners, surveyors, scientists, technicians, and of course, support staff. We primarily serve state and local governments along with select private uh, and institutional clients. And we define our verticals as public works, mobility, water, buildings, and land. The other thing I would say is we're 100% employee owned through our employee stock ownership plan or ESOP, which really is a cornerstone of our culture. Yeah, that's great. And ESOPs, from what I've heard of them, um, are a really great way to grow a firm. And I know it's a whole topic for a whole other podcast. And he saw it, it is, it really is. <laughs> but but uh, for us, it's a good, uh, it's a good match. Not for yeah. everybody, but it really works well for our firm. That's great. And so, I want to hear a little bit about your career journey to get started here, Gil. I think the one thing that you know our listeners should really know about you is you've been the CEO for I think almost eight years now or so. But you've spent, you've worked on a lot of projects as an engineer and you've designed many projects. So you have a really good understanding from the ground up, I guess is a good way to say it. And I know that not all, you know, executives and leaders in the civil engineering world have that background. I think that could be challenging per se. Maybe, you know, not that it can't be overcome, but maybe just talk to us a little bit about your career journey. Sure. You know, why did I go into engineering? I, I think uh, it was really for no reason other than my, my dad was an engineer. He was a mechanical engineer. And, and that was really all I knew. And, you know, I inherited some good math abilities, although my high school math grades might have suggested otherwise. And, and so when I got to college, um, I started out in mechanical engineering. And I, I struggled for the first few years. I, I was trying to succeed the same way I did in high school, which was sort of on natural ability and not doing the work. And that didn't work. Uh, and ultimately, I actually had to drop out of engineering for a semester and take some gen ed classes, which actually was a really great semester. I never, never would have taken some of the history and literature classes that I did. I actually um, declared a journalism major, which lasted for about two weeks, because when my dad learned of that, he uh, I got a call at school. And let's just say he dispensed some fatherly advice. Uh, I had a number of friends that were civil engineers and they said that I should come over and join them. And uh, I, I did, but it was sort of begrudgingly. I, I really didn't know that that's what I wanted to do. But I think as, as you and a lot of people know, things have a way of working out. And as I started taking the classes, I discovered my passion for water and wastewater and fluid mechanics and you know, had no idea going in that that's what was waiting for me. And, and that's really where I got galvanized about what I wanted to do. Uh, when I graduated, uh, I ended up taking a job with a natural gas utility working on their pipe distribution networks. But after about five years, I realized that I really wanted to be uh, doing water and wastewater in a consulting environment. And if I was going to do that, I was gonna need to go to grad school. I was married at that time, but we didn't have kids, and we recognized that the window of doing that 
kind of in an easier fashion was going to close. So, uh, you know, 27 years old, quit our job, sold our house, and uh, I returned to grad school, couch surfed for a while. <laughs> and uh, but I got in and out in a year because I was really focused on getting back, uh, getting back to work. And um, I interviewed with a number of firms. And when I interviewed with uh, MSA, it was Midstate Associates at the time. Uh, I really detected a culture that was different from all of the other firms. So I actually accepted the lowest of the three job offers I had at the time because I felt uh, that there was an opportunity here. I felt uh, drawn to the culture and to the people that I'd be working with. And uh, really, as you said, I was a project engineer working on wastewater treatment plant designs for about three years. But being that I had five years of experience, including some supervisor experience, uh, I made it into the role of team leader within about three years here, which was sort of the seller doer role, going out, getting the work and doing the high level, you know, engineering, but more delegating and developing other people and leading a profitable team. And I did that probably for the, that was the longest job I held here. I did that for about 13 years and um, really enjoyed that. And then it really went gradually from the challenge of um, designing a wastewater treatment plant to meet this difficult situation to the new challenge was running a successful business unit. And uh, by about 2007, then I, I was asked to join the board of directors. And then the following year, I was made a vice president in charge of a group of teams like I had been running. And so from 2008 to about 2013, I was running that portion of the business. And as we might get into later, then I became president and CEO in 2013. But um, I still love it when I get an opportunity to talk about wastewater uh, with some of my clients or some of our engineers, but that's becoming less and less every day. Yeah, for sure. And a couple, couple of things I want to ask you about in regards to that journey. Number one, because I get this question a lot from engineers, did you find the master's degree for you to be helpful in practice? Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, the epiphany I had was the more I learned, the more I realized I didn't know. So for me, um, I had a pretty basic civil and environmental engineering background, but I knew I wanted to do water and wastewater. So there's much more process chemistry and biology that you really need, uh, I felt, to, to, to succeed in the design world. And that's what the master's degree gave me. I did a lot of growing up in that five years between my undergrad and my graduate time. And that uh, my, my attitude towards school was much more serious. I had some real world skills to apply to, you know, solving, uh, you know, problems within the, the grad program. And, and I just really got so much out of it. And that allowed me to walk into MSA. And on day one, they handed me a dechlorination project. And I had done that in school and was just able to pick it up and, and run. And I think that's partly why I was able to um, advance as rapidly as I did. No, that, that's good to hear because I do get that question a lot. And the one thing that I'll say for those of you out there, because I definitely agree with Gil in terms of getting that master's degree as early as you can in terms of life responsibilities and things that will happen to you as you, you know, grow older, of course. But the one thing too that I'll also say in terms of the civil world is having an internship where you can get exposure to some of the different disciplines in civil engineering, or even if you go out into the, the quote unquote real world and you get a job for a year or two, then you go for a master's degree. I think the, the one thing you want to be sure about, which it sounds like Gil was when you take that master's degree is, is it the discipline of civil that you're excited about and that, you know, you really want to practice because that's the one thing with civil engineering is there's a, there's a ton of sub disciplines. I mean, my wife and I are both civil engineers, but she's geotech and I did land development. So we could talk about stuff all day and, and it, they wouldn't intersect per se. So I think the key thing there is, you know, just try to get clear on, on what direction you're headed. Um, Cause that may be the reason for some that I've heard that the master's degree wasn't helpful because you ended up working in a different discipline. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. The other thing too, Gil, that I wanted to ask you about in terms of your development and your growth. I think a lot of engineering professionals that I know in the civil world, they come out, they're excited to start working. And then of course, the next thing on their horizon is I want to become a manager, whatever they call it, project manager, team manager and, and grow. Now you got to CEO. So, you know, you, you kind of went all the way. And the question I have for you is, is, was that something that you were planning for or how did that evolution happen? Or did you just end up liking management and kind of kept going with it? It's more of the latter. I mean, it's, it's kind of laughable. Um, did I have a career goal of becoming a CEO? You know, the answer is no. Um, in as much as I tend to be a planner 
Um, I was, I never had a career plan for myself. I've, I've always enjoyed doing what I was doing every step of the way. I always viewed that whatever it is I'm doing right now is the most important thing I could be doing. And I didn't really think too much about what comes next. Just wanted to do a good job. And, and through that, then you start getting more responsibility and you start taking, you know, gravitating towards management. And I found out, you know, I was interested in that too. Some, some people have no taste for uh, leading people and, and managing things. They want to stay in that technical track. But I found it fairly easy for me to divert my attention to uh, things that were more impactful to the firm. Um, so, you know, one of the challenges for me is I never really considered myself a people person. If I go back to my reasons for going into engineering, I thought it was, well, there's a job I can just go and, and not have to deal with people. And uh, of course, as it turned out, that's nothing could be further from the truth. But um, I, I really align myself more with the operational aspects of the firm. And over time, uh, working with our director of operations, I, I could envision myself doing something like what he was doing. And, and we were working closely together. And as it turned out, he started dropping some hints to me that he was thinking that I should be succeeding him as president. And this was about eight years before his retirement. And uh, he continued to mentor me. And over the last couple of years, that really started to ramp up. Now, at the time, the company had separate president and CEO. Over our history, sometimes they were occupied by one person. Other times they were split, oftentimes preparing for a transition. Uh, this was one of those times where the roles were split. Uh, but as it happened, there was some friction between those two. And I come to, came to realize that the whole organization was really feeling the tension from that relationship. And then it happened to coincide with the Great Recession. And it happened to coincide with an acquisition that we were doing. So there was a lot of stress that was contributing to a, a situation where just two individuals that had done a lot for the firm but had stylistic differences. So as I started looking into the role I would be stepping into, I, I was seeing there would be some challenges there. Um, and as the president's retirement was looming, I suggested to the board that I would benefit from some leadership training. I really had not had a lot. And specifically, I had heard of something from the American Council of Engineering Companies called their Senior Executives Institute. I heard good things about it and I brought it to the board. I says, I think I should go. Uh, it's expensive, but I think we'll get our money back. And it was at a really difficult time for the company financially, but they agreed and made the commitment to send me. And it was really that experience that shaped me as a leader. And it made me own up to the leadership problems that the company was having and further to recognize that it was my role to address them. So it followed that I not only took on the role of president, which was planned, but at the same time, I took on the role of CEO, which was not planned. So my planning and mentoring had focused on these operational aspects, um, but the mentoring on and understanding of the CEO position was really something I had to kind of start from scratch with. Uh, and now, uh, actually two years ago, at the beginning of 2019, I have spun off most of my operational duties to our chief operating officer. And now I really am solely inhabiting the role of CEO which is where I focus on the future of the organization and be the communicator in chief. So is that the role that I imagined for myself? No, but I really honestly feel it's the role that I was made for. That's great. And, you know, for those of you out there, you know, thinking, I know some of these terms like CEO, people throw it around a lot. I like to think of it as a visionary for a company, you know, uh, as Gil said, when you're thinking about the future, you're thinking about big things that maybe a lot of other people, they can't think about it because they're strapped in all these details and projects and things like that. But Gil, going back to kind of your career journey for a minute, I want to ask you this question. And, and I know you probably won't say this, but I will, but you, you have a track record of being a great engineer and you have a track record of being a great leader based on some of the things you've done at MSA. And I read them in your bio. In order to do that, you definitely have to be able to manage people and you have to be able to manage projects. There's no kind of way around that. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's not to say that someone can't learn how to do it. I mean, for you, it sounded like some of those things came easier than others maybe, but I'm just wondering for the engineers listening right now that want to be a manager, maybe they want to be an executive, they want to be a visionary even say, but you know, they, they like working with people, but they struggle in some instances and they really want to improve those skills. What, what advice can you give them? Yeah, the first thing I want to do is parse out that project management and people leadership are two really different skill sets. And, and so you need to address them. You need to get 
training and experience on project management, that's going to come earlier in your career and that should come first. You need that as one of your basic skills. Then you need to decide, am I interested in that? And we've seen a number of people try and find out that they really weren't interested. They want, really are better off at project management because when you step into the realm of people leadership, you're all in and, and their problems are your problems and you have to address them. So, you know, the, the thing that I learned through the, the SCI course is it's all about people and uh, understanding people starts with yourself. Um, what we call personal mastery is foundational to leadership. You really have to be able to develop an unvarnished understanding of who you are. Because let, let's start with the basic uh, assumption that nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect, therefore I can't hold that standard on to anybody else. And what are my imperfections, right? What are the things I'm going to spend the rest of my career and the rest of my life trying to improve on? I'm going to be acutely aware of those things and if I'm going to be a good leader. And then once you have that understanding that I've got things I'm working on, so does everybody else. And that creates an empathy and a willingness to sort of meet people where they're at, say, how can I help them be better? That's really what people leadership is. And I've seen too many people uh, apply sort of one, one way, one style of leadership to all people. And, and each person sort of needs something different from you. And that's the part about understanding yourself. So then you can understand the different types of personalities, how people are wired differently so that you can effectively coach a variety of people. At the end of the day, leadership is about making other people better. It's not about leading the charge up the hill and having everybody follow you and glory for the leader. It's no, it's about if I do my job well, I've got other people who can uh, function effectively without me there. And someday I can retire and I know the organization is going to be even better off. Yeah, that's great. And, and a couple of things that I just want to, you know, reinforce or, you know, maybe hop on top of that with is number one, what Gil said about, you know, management being, you know, understanding people that's kind of a little bit of a misnomer. I think a lot of times, well, you know, listen, as engineers, we're used to equations when we're younger, right? We're plugging in numbers, things are coming out, we're getting the right answer, quote unquote. There's no equations for management, right? Like Gil said, every person is different. So you can't use something with maybe one person on your team and then go and use it again with someone else. It doesn't always work that way. Some of the skills might help you and some of the conversations certainly might help you. But people are different and you need to take the time to understand them and understand what motivates someone, what drives them, how they like to even receive messages from you. I've had that with some of our team here. Some people like it spelled out in bullets. Some people like it in a paragraph or on a phone call. When you understand those things, it makes, you know, leadership and, and management um, easier. But the yeah, other I, I, can, I, can I just inter interrupt? Because yeah, I, I do think you just said it, management and leadership, and, and we really need to understand they're two different things management is, is looking at the numbers and it's sort of like treating the system and to a degree the people like like parts of a machine right we got to crank up utilization we got to do this that's management leadership is trying to figure out how to motivate people to do the right thing and and that's where the people skills come in and i i really look at it as you go from a project manager but once we you have supervisory authority over people they report to you their development is is dependent on you it, it's people leadership. I don't even like to use the term management anymore. We, we, I, in fact, one of the first things I did in stepping into this role was I changed the name of the management group to the leadership team. And, and that really, that little subtle word change means a lot uh, because we are leaders of the company, not just managers of our part of the company. And we have to function as a cohesive team. That, that's awesome. And, and that takes me back kind of to the second thing that I wanted to reinforce that you said with the people skills versus the project management skills. So at EMI, we have training courses on each one. They're separate training courses. And a lot of times companies call us and they say, well, you know, we've got some engineers, either they're going to be managers soon or they're already managers and we need project management training for them. So when I say to them, you know, well, tell me more about that. They'll say, well, you know, they can't communicate great with the clients. They can't present the projects accordingly. So, you know, I kind of stopped in there and I said, listen, there's really a triangle that I see with engineers. There's a technical skills that you learn in school and you learn earlier in your career. Then there's your PM skills that would be, you know, project scope, project planning, scope creep, scheduling, all that stuff. And then there's your people skills, which is communicating with people, running meetings effectively, you know, having conversations, listening. And so I think that if you're out there and you're an engineer and you're saying to yourself, I need project management training or your company said, I want to get you project management training. 
make sure you understand what your needs are, what your team's needs are. If you're, if you're a leader in the company, because it may be both, it may be one or the other, but a lot of times I feel like things get lumped under project management training. It's like a common term and it's just not, they're not the same. They're totally different. Yeah. I think when, when we define project management training at MSA, it is the entire enchilada from the early relationship building and marketing pursuit efforts all the way through project closeout. You can't just carve out a chunk in the middle and say that's project management. At least for us, it's, it's cradle to grave. Um, you talked about how you define the world as a triangle. Um, I've defined it in five parts and we're working on our career charting graphics to illustrate this, but everybody comes in with a technical skill. That's why you're getting hired, right? Um, Patrick Lencioni uh, calls that permission to play. It just gets you in the sandbox, right? Once you're in the sandbox, now we can start to lay around the project management skills, the client liaison skills, which is a lot of the marketing and sales piece, and people leadership is its own uh, regime. All the while, you have to have an increasing level of business acumen as you go. So those are the five. It's technical project management, marketing, uh, people leadership, and then uh, the, the business skills. That's great. So a lot there for you to kind of unpack when you think about your career or if you're listening, you, you, uh, you're you leading a team of professionals. You can think through some of that for sure. So Gil, let, let's talk a little bit about our industry in the world of civil engineering. Obviously, 2020 has been a year like, like no other, uh, lots of stuff going on. And, you know, some, I, I talk to a lot of civil leaders as I'm sure you do, and you have your leaders in your firm. Um, many companies have been busier than ever this year, but what are the, what are you thinking right now? And I know there's uncertainty, but what are you thinking about the next few years in civil engineering? Yeah, it, it's exactly what you said. Um, everybody's having great years. Everybody's expecting some kind of a downturn in 2021, but beyond that, it's uncertainty. I remember in 2009, at the very beginning of that crisis, I was already planning for our recovery, right? And late 2009, 2010, that's where my mind was. And then we learned that that recovery didn't happen quickly. For us in particular, it had a very long tail. We were still being impacted by that recession in 2013 when I came into this role. But the beauty of being in civil engineering is that in general, we're all in the infrastructure business. Our infrastructure needs continuous renewal and replacement, and we've not been doing that at the rate at which it's been re deteriorating, right? So we go back to 2009, we saw projects being deferred, roads, bridges, wastewater treatment plants, things were kicked down the road. And we were just starting to maybe get caught up on some of the things that we deferred last time. So now we're staring into a 2021, and we're kind of assuming the same thing is going to happen. We're going to defer some things. There's going to be a downturn. We're going to get further behind. And all of that at some point has to come home to roost. So if I then I think about not only repair and replacement, but what are the future needs of infrastructure, right? We're seeing things being uh, functionally obsolete because we're going to need a connected infrastructure, data gathering and transmission to enable autonomous vehicles. Uh, so not even things that don't need repairing and replacing, they're going to need to be modernized regardless of their physical condition. So for me, uh, all of this is to say, to, especially to those of you early in your career, civil engineering is and will be a great place to spend your career. The world is waking up to our need to revitalize that infrastructure. So much of it was, was built 50 or more years ago. And that progress has been slow. How many years has ASCE been giving out a D in their infrastructure report cards, right? So to me, it's an unavoidable conclusion that there will be much work for us to do. The only question is whether we see that returning in 2022 or will it be a more prolonged recession before we see a big uptick in demand? I think for purposes of our planning, we're expecting you know, 2020 to carry over into the first couple quarters of 2021 as in dealing with the virus. I would be, I think it's hopeful that by then we have a vaccination first and that people are getting it second so that the economy starts to reopen such that by the third and fourth quarter of 2021, our clients are optimistic enough to plan for sort of a return to normal in 2022. But if that confidence isn't there in late 2021, then this is going to be a, a more prolonged downturn. Yeah. No one's going to want to spend money if it's, no. if the confidence isn't there. Um, and by the way, I just want to mention, Gil mentioned the ASC infrastructure, the report card. It's 
really interesting. If you're not familiar with it, we actually did a, an interview with Peyton Gibson who walked us through the process of it. And we'll link to that in the show notes for this episode. So you can learn okay. about that because it's totally related to the future in my opinion as well. And so, you know, all that being said, Gil, I'm, I'm interested to learn about uh, you as the CEO. We talked about how you're thinking about the future for your firm. You know, it's like a visionary role. Now that we've gone through this pandemic, which nobody has been through before, really to this extent, at least in the engineering world like this, with the economy, what do you, how does that change or what are you going to, what are you going to do in terms of thinking about the future going forward? Like in terms of risk or risk mitigation, like, is that now, are those no all new things that you have to think about and what you're doing? Well, risk mitigation is always there, but now we're having to apply it to a new set of unknowns and new risks. So uh, I'll give you a couple examples. I mentioned we're kind of rebooting a strategic planning uh, event starting now that'll take us, you know, 21 to 2023. Um, we did some work last year that a lot of it's invalid because the world has changed since then. And, and of course, nobody saw this coming. So thinking about the future of work, right? Many people are working remotely and what is that gonna mean in terms of people's expectations? We have leases coming due for office space every year. What should we be doing with those office spaces? Are people gonna show up? to these nice new offices or do we need to retool? And that's where the opinions uh, of people I speak to in the industry are all over the map from some that are doubling down and saying, we're gonna be more remote than not. And they're working on reducing all their footprints. Uh, we've also seen some in the tech industry have tried that and are going back to more in person. I think we're feeling that the design process benefits from collaboration. And although we can use tools like this to do an awful lot that we couldn't do in the past, that that in-person relationship builds trust. And when you trust someone, you're willing to share work. And, and so I think, you know, we're gonna accommodate um, a growing number of people that are teleworking, but I still think the core of our business has to reside in some type of a collaborative work where people are allowed to, to really get to know each other, which is best served in person. There's too many uh, serendipitous conversations that happen when people are co-located. So that's one of those uncertainties that's out there. Um, mm -hmm. Scenario planning is, is a good exercise and there's lots that have been written on it, but um, it allows you to explore a number of different futures. And something I came across the other day made me think, I just told you what I think is gonna happen in 2021. I'm gonna be wrong, no matter what, whatever path I chart isn't gonna be how it's gonna go. So spend some time exploring, what do you think is not going to happen? Because for example, in 2019, we did not expect a pandemic and a recession, right? And I don't know that I would have thought of that as a scenario, but if you spend some time thinking about what you don't expect to happen, well, I don't expect we're gonna have a vaccine later on this year, such that 2021 is gonna be great. I don't expect that we're going to um, not have an effective vaccine or that people won't be taking it such that in 2021, the virus is still rampant by the time we get to Q4 and things are looking really dark, right? But now I should spend some time exploring those scenarios. And uh, there, there's two things. You can look for the commonalities. There might be some things that we should do no matter what. And then um, the other, it, it, this type of planning is talking about um, creating a memory of the future. Right, So I've played this scenario once in my mind, and if it actually starts coming to fruition, I have a memory of living it through our scenario planning, and now I can act more quickly in figuring out what we should do. So that, that's probably the best thing that, that I know a lot of firms are doing and will be doing as, as we look ahead, because frankly, the, the, the buzzword right now for me is uncertainty. And uh, no one can profess to have all the answers. There are people that are going to make bold moves. There are people that think this is the time to go out and acquire firms. Uh, but that might not turn out to be a good thing if you uh, make a big bet and this uh, recovery is much more protracted than we think it's going to be. So at the end of the day, I have to preserve the firm. And I have to ensure that this firm uh, lives on and gets through this. So there's always going to be, uh, at least for me, a sort of conservative element. Um, but that said, there are some that are going to succeed wildly uh, on making bold moves and, and some that are going to fail. Yeah, no, that's, and, and again, that is a lot of, those are some great strategies in terms of thinking about anything, whether it's your career or your, your business, your company, your team. Um, I read something similar in a book recently where they said, you know, imagine you're building, I don't know, a training program and the training program failed. 
ask yourself why it failed, right? right? Like future visiting, similar, exactly what you said, if it doesn't work, what are you going to do next? And, and we spent a lot of time during the pandemic. In fact, I probably spoke to 30 or 40 individuals in your seat in the civil engineering world for this new civil engineering collective that we launched. And I think the word uncertainty, I looked at my notes, it was in every one of the phone calls, <laughs> literally in every one. And I was like looking for that common thread and for sure um, that was it. So I think I want to ask you about Gil is learning and development. Obviously it's something that's, you know, near and dear to my heart. I left engineering to get into training and development. And I know for you, you've been really committed to kind of annually increasing MSA's commitment to training and development. It's, it's a big thing for you. Can you just talk about, you know, why you feel it's so important and why you're so, you know, interested in it? Sure. You know, without learning and development, we remain static. Um, John Gardner, who's an author that I admire, suggests in a book called Self-Renewal, that by middle age, most people become mummified, suggesting that we get set in our ways and, uh, and our opinions, thinking that maybe now I know enough to get by in life and, and do our job. Uh, there's an old adage that you probably heard that says, what got you here ain't going to get you there, right? Mm -hmm. That means if you don't grow yourself, you shouldn't expect to be able to move on to new or more responsibility. You're going to get stale. You're going to get in a rut. You're going to have to continually build your skills if you want to do anything new or different. So those of you that are out there wondering, how is it that I can advance my career? Think about what is it that you're going to build in terms of new skills to offer your employer so that you can make the case or demonstrate that you're ready for something new. I'm really somebody who eschews a daily routine in favor of having the agility to adapt to whatever's going on. In fact, I can think of no more horrible fate than to be mummified by middle age. I, I, so I apply that to myself as well as to everyone around me. And it's only through learning that we can grow and only through growth that we can approach true self-fulfillment, really becoming the best version of ourselves. And clearly the young people coming into the industry place a high value on this. I was working with a human capital consultant and he told me recently that a lack of learning and development opportunities has supplanted their supervisor as the leading reason cited why people leave their employer. Mm -hmm. So that tells me that, and I, I use this in our new employee orientation, we're entering into a relationship or a partnership and it's reasonable for them to expect that we're going to do something to allow their continued development and growth. So That's I just awesome. know that as a young engineer entering the workforce, when I came in, I realized how little I really knew about how to do anything. This was maybe coming out of uh, my undergrad. And I also recognized that what my engineering education had taught me was how to learn new things. When you think about engineering problem solving, we identify the knowns and the unknowns, we make reasonable assumptions when we have to, and we set about solving the problem. So everything I encountered in my career was just another problem to be solved because I had learned that mindset. So I was really gratified this summer when we did a, a sit down with our interns and one of them made a, a similar statement that he had learned how to learn. And so once again, I turned to John Gardner, who put it far more eloquently when he wrote, the ultimate goal of the educational system is to shift to the individual the burden of pursuing their own education. And I think if you subscribe to that and you apply that to your life and your career, that you now have the burden of being responsible for your own learning and growth and development, um, the job never ends and there's so many things to learn uh, out there and and that's to me what makes this whole career so exciting is that opportunity to continue to learn. That's great and it's really for me it's, it's very powerful to hear someone in your seat talk like that. I mean the reason I left my civil engineering career 10 years ago and started the training business was because I felt that there was kind of a lack of professional development support for engineers and a lot of companies that didn't provide the learning and training programs that I thought should be there and that we needed to succeed. And a lot of that's changed over the years. Thankfully, I've seen a lot more learning and development, but, you know, hearing someone, at, you know, who is leading a firm being so committed to that is, I think, you know, really says a lot about, you know, your firm and, and how you invest in people. And I, I can, you know, totally confirm from what Gil's sentiments around what younger people want, because I talk to them all the time in terms of our coaching and training programs, and they're looking for learning and development. In fact, when companies contact us for training, you know, they're, of course, really focused on getting the people that they want to get trained certain skill sets, which is great. But I always remind them that the other benefits to training programs are retaining 
people and recruiting people. Because if someone's coming to your firm for an interview and they say, well, what kind of training programs? Oh, well, we invest in this type of, you know, people skills, people leadership training programs. Okay, that's great. That's important to people. It's not just about a salary or, you know, some of the other benefits. It's about how you're going to invest in them. And I think that you need to be really, be really super aware of that because it is important going forward. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a, a short break with Gil. We're going to come back and we're going to wrap up by putting them on the civil engineering hot seat segment. So we'll be back in just a minute. All right. I'm back with Gil Honch, president and CEO of MSA Professional Services. And Gil, it's time that we put you on the civil engineering hot seat. You ready? I'm ready. All right. First question. Are there any specific rituals that you practice every day? For example, do you have a specific morning routine or lunchtime routine or something that you do consistently on a daily basis that has contributed to your success? I really have to say no. I, as I mentioned earlier, I thrive in the variety of life and love that every day is different from the other. It goes along with the appeal of consulting where every day you're dealing with different people, different projects, different challenges. You know, some days I need to be in early, some day, sometimes I'm working late. Uh, at night, uh, but other times I can dial it back and pay attention to other parts of my life that I might have been neglecting. So I think the fact that I'm open to change and able to adapt allows me to be agile in confronting new challenges. I try not to have too many preconceived notions and, and that served me well. So other than maybe getting up and having a fried egg every morning, I really try not to let myself get into a rut. That's great. That's great. I love that. And I do, I agree with that. And a lot of sentiments, that was one of the reasons I turned to engineering, civil engineering. I feel like there's different challenges. There's different things going on every day. All right, Gil, next question. You recommended a few books already, but is there one book that, you know, you might recommend to people in our industry that are, you know, progressing through their careers or just one book for you that's been really helpful in your progression as a leader? Yeah, I would have to say The Advantage by Patrick Lencioni. It's been very impactful in terms of understanding the importance of organizational health I think our organization was suffering from a lack of health when I stepped into this role. And that really helped to crystallize my thoughts on how we want to be as an organization, what we can't afford to tolerate in terms of behavior. Uh, that was used as the uh, foundation for our, my, my, the first strategic planning uh, effort that I led in 2013. We subsequently made that into a big read. We made that book available to the entire company and had all these discussion groups. And I tell you, the language from that group still permeates our company. People will cite that all the time. We use it now in, in our internal leadership development course as well. That's great. And, and I love it whenever we hear about a new book. I mean, I've asked this question 154 episodes in a row, and we haven't gotten that book yet. So I love when we get a new book. Um, great. It's, it's, it's exciting. All right. So two more to go here. Next one, thinking back on your managers of the past, as you you know, kind of came through and people that maybe, you know, led teams for you. If you picture some of your favorite leaders or, you know, project managers, whoever you can think of, what was it that maybe made them your favorite? What were the ones that stood out to you? Why did they stand out? Sure. I can picture three that I had a, a, as immediate supervisors of my career. And again, like I said earlier, none of them are perfect, right? I shouldn't expect them to be, but each one of them contributed something different to my development. But if I'm looking for a commonality, what stands out about each of them is they all took an interest in me and in helping me so that they spent time teaching me or demonstrating by example, you know, how to do things. And, and I remember my dad in his career, he always talked about how important it was to have a champion. And I finally understood what he meant when I had people championing me. So now that I'm in this position, I keep that foremost in my mind. How can I be that champion for somebody else? That's great. And, and it goes right back to, obviously you could see where you got it from, but it goes right back to what you said earlier when you said, you know, leadership is about understanding what people need. Right. Yep. And that's, that's exactly what you've learned from your you know, managers or mentors. All right. I got one final question for you here, Gil. We call it the civil engineering career elevator advice question. If you got into an elevator with a, um, an engineer in our industry and you had 30 to 40 seconds with him or her, and you had to give them career advice in that short period of time, what would it be? Well, first I'd stop the elevator. No, I, I would say focus on improving your communication skills. You're often going to find yourself to be the smartest person in the room, but your success will not be determined by how smart you are, but by, well, how you can communicate what you know to a group of what will often be non-engineers. So if you can check your ego at the door and have some empathy that they don't know what you know, that's why they hired you. 
then you can realize that the obligation of being the smartest person in the room is to teach them something. People will hire someone who they think can teach them something. So if you regard your writing and speaking ability as one of or your most important skill set, and if they aren't where you want them to be, then dedicate yourself to improving them. How? By reading, by paying attention and thinking that your communication is important and by asking for honest feedback from someone skilled at it. Awesome. That, that, that's great advice. And that's a great way for us to, to wrap it up here. Once again, Gil Hange, president and CEO of MSA Professional Services. You can check out Gil on LinkedIn. He's pretty active online. And Gil, thanks so much for spending some time with us here on the Civil Engineering Podcast. Thank you, Anthony. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast on YouTube produced by the Engineering Management Institute. We're always looking for new ways to help engineers become effective managers and leaders. You can view all of our content on our website at engineeringmanagementinstitute.org and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here for our weekly videos. Until next time, please continue to engineer your own success.